what we are going to do now is take a look at an intuitive way by which I could have come up with those numbers for this particular architecture and then we will later expand upon it and see how this can be solved in general. Let's basically ask the question, how were these folding sets obtained? Right? Was there any method to it or was it random? Right? In other words, if I had just chosen random values for the folding sequence, right? as I have put down over here, I basically just assigned uh, operation number 1 to happen at time 1, operation 2 to happen at time 2, operation 3 to uh, operation sorry operation 1 to happen at time 0, operation 2 to happen at time 1, operation 3 to happen at time 2 and 4 to happen at 3. Okay. I have just chosen a sequence like that. The question is, is this valid in the first place? And you know, so far so good if I look at for example 1 to 2, I find that the df value turns out to be 4 which is positive. So it is not a problem at least so far. But if I look at 3 to 1, right, that is this edge that I have over here, I find that if I do the computation of df, I will end up getting this value out here, minus 3, okay, which basically tells me that this particular assignment trying to just randomly put 0, 1, 2, 3 as the different time instants for these operations had a problem, right. So it looks as though random assignment is not going to work in general, it can very easily lead you to some kind of a conflict. Is there a better and more systematic way of doing it? Okay. So, in order to understand that, what I am going to do is take this entire graph and construct the directed acyclic graph corresponding to one iteration of this. How do we do something like that? Like I said earlier, we remove the edges with delays on them. That is to say, those edges with delays are the inter iteration dependencies. Right? That is to say, it is saying that this is whatever 2 is consuming from 1 corresponds to what is computed by 1 in the previous iteration. Right? Remember that the rectangles that I have shown over here, the D elements do not correspond to physical registers, right? because in the actual system that we have, I have only one adder and one multiplier, one hardware adder and one hardware multiplier. Over there, Right? In other words, corresponding to this diagram that I have over here, every one of these is a physical register. In this, what I have is each of these delay elements that I have is actually a logical delay element. It basically says this is one iteration uh, dependency. Okay? So with that in mind, if I now remove these delay edges, what I will end up with is something that looks like this. right? And if I redraw this graph, right, all I have done is basically taken the exact same set of operations but redrawn them in a sort of you know top to bottom manner. Okay, so I have this sequence over here, 5, 3, 1, like this. I have this sequence over here, 4, 2, and then I have 6, 7, and 8 as individual elements without any input or output dependencies. Nothing within the same iteration essentially. If I just take that end, uh, exact same thing and now look at the amount of time required for each of these operations, what I find is that op operation 5 is a multiplier, multiplication, right? And it has a latency of 2 clock cycles. Similarly, operation 3 is an addition which has a latency of 1 cycle, and operation 1 is also an addition with 1 cycle latency, and so on, right? I have basically got the structure over here. What I am going to do is to because I know that I have only one hardware, right? One hardware element for an adder, one hardware element for a multiplier. I am going to draw out the different clock cycles at which each operation gets scheduled, so to say. Okay. So the first thing I can do is I can see that you know maybe let's take operation number five and put it down in clock cycle number zero. Okay. That is to say the very first cycle of my iteration. Now you will notice that in the M, I have only shaded out the first entry for M. Why is that? Because it is pipelined, right? meaning that even though 5 will take 2 cycles to give me the result, it means that in the next clock cycle, I can at least start another operation, another multiplication. Okay. 
After that, I can look at operation number three. It has to happen after five, right? Which means that the adder, I can block it off for clock cycle number two, right? So assuming it's zero, one, two, three are the clock cycles. So A gets blocked off for cycle number two. Then comes operation one, which blocks off the adder for cycle number three. Okay. After that, I have a choice, right? I go to the next block and say, okay, I'll pick up operation number four and put it in cycle number zero of the adder, which turns out to be free. So that's good. So I can put it over there. And then comes operation two, right? Which is in cycle number one of the adder. And now I see that the adder is full. All four addition operations have been scheduled. There are three multiplications left. Okay. Now here I'm going to sort of dodge one question. Right, the natural question would be, okay, which one should I pick next? And sort of the natural choice, just given the fact that, you know, we normally read from left to right, would be to choose six. Instead, I'm going to choose eight. Okay, why will become clear later. Okay, for the time being, just six, seven, and eight, I mean, there's nothing really to differentiate between them. So I'm going to pick eight. And I can say that eight is now scheduled in, uh, you know, cycle number one. And... After that comes operation six, which is scheduled in cycle number two. And finally seven, which is scheduled in cycle number three. And because it takes two clock cycles, it actually means that it will finish into the next iteration. Is that a problem? No, because the operation five of the next iteration can still start here, right? Five of next iteration can start at this point. Right. So there's no real problem with seven spilling over like this, as long as there is no dependency violation, which we will have to check later separately. Okay. So now given this graph, given this sort of, you know, set of uh, boxes that I've shaded in over here, how does that translate into numbers? Operation number five is scheduled in time zero, right? Which is what I see over here. So I can basically say that because it's a multiplier multiplication, it gets scheduled in uh, time zero on the sequence corresponding to multiplication that is S2. Okay. What about this operation number three? This gets scheduled at time two on S1. Operation one gets scheduled at time three on S1. Similarly, operation four gets scheduled at time zero on S1. Operation two gets scheduled at time one on S1. Right? Eight gets scheduled at time one on S2. Six gets scheduled at time two on S2. And seven gets scheduled at time three on S2. Okay. This is exactly the sequence that we have in the original schedule. Okay. So now you can see that there was sort of a systematic way by which we came up with these numbers. Was this the only possible set of numbers for most of the operations? Actually, you know, if you go and look at it, you will notice that for 5, 3, 1, 4 and 2, there was really no other choice. Okay. And, you know, uh, so how could you have predicted that? How could all of that come have come over there? What were the reasons behind it? We'll understand a little bit better when we look at what are some of the basic kinds of schedules, right? Some kind of what is usually called the ASAP, the as soon as possible and the ALAP or as late as possible schedules. Define something called the slack that is available for each node in the graph. And then we can systematically construct schedules in this way.